Welcome back to Finals at the Academy. What I just realised last time is we got the mnemonic for the safe code, but I didn't interpret it, which I should probably do right now, right? While I remember. So, page 8 is the hours. Where's the mnemonic? This is the glyphs. Um, the Necromancer Ulm, but an archer, and seven sailors to the undead. Okay, so this is a five digit, it's got to be glyph digits, right? Necromancer Ulm, so the Necromancer, archer, seven sailor undead. Necromancer, archer, Sailor on Death is eight five seven six four, right? Because of the seven. Eight five seven six four. Eight five seven. So Nick Manson put an archer and seven sailors to the undead. Okay. What does this go down to? Oh, is this the the western stairway? Yeah, it's the janitor's room. Okay. So we'll try and avoid the main. Hello. That's of interest. I wonder if the uh, librarians. Hmm. I mean, that looks like we're already on here, but. Um... Right, we'll have to save that for later. None of the others have have so had them, right? So it's just like so that's the attic. Oof! Definitely could get a lock. Hope nobody comes in here and catches me doing uh, things I shouldn't be doing. Right. I'm just going to leave that unlocked for the moment. I want to. I want to see what we have on this floor where we have not been. So, Majesty Yolana, well, she won't be in her room. She's downstairs. Sleeping in my rooms. I don't suppose he comes in here, right? This is her private quarters. Nice little bird. Ashes, a fish's bird seed. Misread it there. office. It's a very nice fireplace. 
practical demon keeping, solitary magic, earth power, elemental fire, deeper than the deeps, the winds, and beyond depth. What does this tell us? The craft of war by the necromancer Ulm. One, laying plans. The necromancer Ulm said, the craft of war is of vital importance to the state. It is a matter of life and death, a road either to safety or to ruin. Hence it is a subject of inquiry which can on no account be neglected. The craft of war, then, is governed by five constant factors to be taken into account in one's deliberations when seeking to determine the conditions in the field. These are the moral law, heaven, earth, the commander, method and discipline. The moral law causes the people to be in complete accord with their ruler so that they will follow him regardless of their lives, undismayed by any danger. Heaven signifies night and day, cold and heat, times and seasons. Earth comprises distances great and small, danger and security, open ground and narrow passes, the chances of life and death. The commander stands for the virtues of wisdom, sincerity, benevolence, courage and strictness. By method and discipline are to be understood the marshalling of the army and its proper subdivisions, graduations of rank among the officers, the maintenance of the roads by which supplies may reach the army, and the control of military expenditure. These five heads should be familiar to every general. He who knows them will be victorious. He who knows them not will fail. Therefore, in your deliberations when seeking to determine their military conditions, let them be made the basis of a comparison in this way. Which of the two rulers is imbued with the moral law? Which of the two generals has most ability? With whom lie the advantages derived from heaven and earth? On which side is discipline most rigorously enforced? Which army is stronger? On which side are officers and men more highly trained? In which army is there the greater constancy both in reward and punishment? By means of these seven considerations I can forecast victory or defeat. The general that harkens to my counsel and acts upon it will conquer. Let such a one be retained in command. The general that harkens not to my counsel, nor acts upon it, will suffer defeat. Let such a one be dismissed. While heading the profit of my counsel, avail yourself also of any helpful circumstances over and beyond the ordinary rules. According as circumstances are favourable, one should modify one's plans. All warfare is based on deception. Hence, when able to attack, we must seem unable. When using our forces, we must seem inactive. When we are near, we must make the enemy believe we are far away. When far away, we must make him believe we are near. Hold out baits to entice the enemy, feign disorder and crush him. If he is secure at all points, be prepared for him. If he is in superior strength, evade him. If your opponent is of choleric temper, seek to irritate him. Pretend to be weak that he may grow arrogant. If he is taking his ease, give him in the rest. If his forces are united, separate them. Attack him where he is unprepared, appear where you are not expected. These military devices leading to victory must not be divulged beforehand. Now the general who wins a battle makes many calculations in his temple ere the battle is fought. The general who loses a battle makes but few calculations beforehand. Thus do many calculations lead to victory and few calculations to defeat, and much more no calculation at all. It is by attention to this point that I can foresee who is likely to win or lose. 2. Waging of War The necromancer Olm said, in the operations of war, where there are in the field a thousand swift chariots, as many heavy chariots and a hundred thousand mail-clad soldiers, with provisions enough to carry them a thousand units distance, the expenditure at home and at the front, including entertainment to guests, small items such as glue and paint, and sums spent on chariots and armour, will reach the total of a thousand ounces of silver per day. Such is the cost of raising an army of one hundred thousand men. When you engage in actual fighting, if victory is long in coming, then men's weapons will grow dull and their ardour will be damped. If you lay siege to a town, you will exhaust your strength. Again, if the campaign is protracted, the resources of the state will not be equal to the strain. Now, when your weapons are dulled, your ardour damned, your strength exhausted and your treasure spent, other chieftains will spring up to take advantage of your extremity. Then no man, however wise, will be able to avert the consequences that must ensue. Thus, though we have heard of stupid haste in war, cleverness has never been seen associated with long delays. There is no instance of a country having benefited from prolonged warfare. It is only one who is thoroughly acquainted with the evils of war that can thoroughly understand the profitable way of carrying it on. The skillful soldier does not raise a second levy, neither are his supply wagons loaded more than twice. Bring war material with you from home, but forage on the enemy. Thus the army will have food enough for its needs. Poverty of the state exchequer causes an army to be maintained by contributions from a distance. Contributing to maintain an army at a distance causes the people to be impoverished. On the other hand, the proximity of an army causes prices to go up, and high prices cause the people of substance to be drained away. 
When this substance is drained away, the peasantry will be afflicted by heavy exactions. With this loss of substance and exhaustion of strength, the homes of the people will be stripped bare, and three-tenths of their income will be dissipated, while government expenses for broken chariots, worn-out horses, breastplates and helmets, bows and arrows, spears and shields, protective mantles, draft oxen and heavy wagons will amount to four-tenths of its total revenue. Hence, a wise general makes a point of foraging on the enemy. One cartload of the enemy's provisions is equivalent to twenty of one's own, and likewise a single pickle of his provender is equivalent to twenty from one's own store. Now in order to kill the enemy, our men must be roused to anger, that they may be advantaged from defeating the enemy, they must have their rewards. Therefore in chariot fighting, when ten or more chariots have been taken, those should be rewarded who took the first. Our own flags should be substituted for those of the enemy, and the chariots mingled and used in conjunction with ours. The captured soldiers should be kindly treated and kept. This is called using the conquered foe to augment one's own strength. In war then, let your great object be victory, not lengthy campaigns. Thus it may be known that the leader of the armies is the arbiter of the people's fate, the man on whom it depends whether the nation shall be in peace or in peril. 3. Attack by Stratagem The necromancer Olm said, In the practical craft of war, the best thing of all is to take the enemy's country whole and intact. To shatter and destroy it is not so good. So too it is better to recapture an army entire than to destroy it, to capture a regiment, a detachment, or a company entire than to destroy them. Hence to fight and conquer in all your battles is not supreme excellence. Supreme excellence consists in breaking the enemy's resistance without fighting. Thus the highest form of generalship is to balk the enemy's plans. The next best is to prevent the junction of the enemy's forces. The next in order is to attack the enemy's army in the field, and the worst policy of all is to besiege walled cities. The rule is not to besiege walled cities if it can possibly be avoided. The preparation of mantlets, movable shelters and various implements of war will take up three whole months, and the piling up of mounds over against the walls will take three months more. The general, unable to control his irritation, will launch his men to the assault like swarming ants, with the result that one third of his men are slain while the town still remains untaken. Such are the disastrous effects of a siege. Therefore, the skilled leader subdues the enemy's troops without any fighting. He captures their cities without laying siege to them. He overthrows their kingdom without lengthy operations in the field. With his forces intact, he will dispute the mastery of the empire, and thus, without losing a man, his triumph will be complete. This is the method of attacking by stratagem. It is the rule in war, if our forces are ten to the enemy's one, to surround him. If five to one, to attack him. If twice as numerous, to divide our army into two. If equally matched, we can offer battle. If slightly inferior in numbers, we can avoid the enemy. If quite unequal in every way, we can flee from him. Hence, though an obstinate fight may be made by a small force, in the end it must be captured by the larger force. Now the general is the bulwark of the state. If the bulwark is complete at all points, the state will be strong. If the bulwark is defective, the state will be weak. There are three ways in which a ruler can bring misfortune upon his army. By commanding the army to advance or to retreat, being ignorant of the fact that it cannot obey. This is called hobbling the army. By attempting to govern an army in the same way as he administers a kingdom, being ignorant of the conditions which obtain in an army. This causes restlessness in the soldiers' minds. By employing the officers of his army without discrimination, through ignorance of the military principles of, of adaptation to circumstances. This shakes the confidence of the soldiers. But when the army is restless and distrustful, the trouble is sure to come from the other feudal princes. This is simply bringing anarchy into the army and flinging victory away. Thus we, may know that, thus we may know that there are five essentials for victory. 1. He will win who knows when to fight and when not to fight. 2. He will win who knows how to handle both superior and inferior forces. 3. He will win whose army is animated by the same spirit throughout all its ranks. 4. He will win who, prepared himself, waits to take the enemy unprepared. 5. He will win who has military capacity and is not interfered with by the gods and demons. Hence the saying, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. Huh. Well, apparently the necromancer Olm also wrote the, uh, the, the art of war, or the craft of war rather. Hello, is that a book? The Emperor's Shadow by the Necromancer Olm. Out of the earth and water he made them. Out of his breath they rose up from the mud in endless multitudes, his killing army, there on the bank of the serpent that brings the world. They fought under the full moon, rising out of the water under the serpent's eye. Asus flew his, slew his father, the good, the just. The serpent swallowed his bones, and the bloody handed child became king. He was born speaking the language of the stars, the emperor of night, the language of thorns, the language of the fiery serpents of the sky, and of the thunderbolts. 
at his side the hooded one, at his side always the one who walks in shadow, whose face is never seen, Cain, who opens doors between stars, who points the way, the sorcerer, the magician, the hooded one whose eye is magic, whose spoken word becomes the word, Cain, the left hand of the emperor, whose right hand is war, a thousand peacocks, a hundred white stallions, ten covers of gold and her heart, the beautiful princess of Crybex, the daughter of swans, the daughter of willow trees, brought to the gold lion of Eden. The shadow of the emperor, the hooded one, who unmasked night, who laid the stars like paving stones, who rode the thunderbolt down the star-cobbled path into day, was Cain, the emperor's twin, silent as lightning is silent, before the thunder speaks. The thunderbolt, the emperor of night, the lord of time, with his army the stars rode out of the gates of nowhere, shook the tall towers of Xerxia to the ground, and plundered the ancient graves of its kings. The lion, fearless, magnificent, unchanging through a thousand years, casts a glance of desire and takes... Walks in shadows, fear that glance. Walk in shadows, fear that glance. The lion sees through time, through cloud and stars, into a different day. Beware if that day is yours. Beware his watching eyes. Seven kingdoms fell to the emperor of the sea. Seven crowns he took, seven pearls of the water of the belfry. He ringed the sea with the dead until the living cried out for mercy. With the faceless one beside him, the emperor walked on water across the belfry, where armies threw down their arms, and his name echoed among the mountains of Carixia. So I don't know if I actually pointed out, but the uh, the primarily important books will uh, get written notes, and the less important ones, or fewer flavor text ones, will just get a hmm. Okay. So this is it's a nice concept to say we can open all these drawers and stuff, but in practice, the, the object selection in this game is really makes it awkward. It's not it's not recasting from your crosshair because you don't have a crosshair, so it's and all of that to find there's nothing in here. Fair enough. Huh? Should I tell the others about the dia? Oh um I just don't care. Back here already. Oh, it's a uh, card. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's great. You got a model train set. My God, it's made around. I love it. That's brilliant. He's got some uh, loot for us as well. Search for his underwear. Nothing. He's got beside his bed, nothing much. But in his office. Old man Boone looked for gold. Back a few years when I was still a young man, I decided to try my fortune hunting gold. So I took myself up to the mountains that summer and went into the caves prospecting. I had wandered around for most of two weeks without spotting a single nugget, when I came across a giant cave spider guarding the largest gold nugget I've ever seen. The nugget was as round and big as my head. Old man Boone paused as one of his admirers stopped off his glass. Well, I brought mining equipment with me, a pick, a shovel, a sluice box, a sieve, and a pan, but nothing that would worry that old spider. Just as I had reached the conclusion that I should back away real quiet like and fetch my hunting bow back to my camp, the spider sensed me and raised her antennae. I turned around and ran for my life before that big old spider could get all of her eight legs a pumping. The spider came right behind me so fast I could feel her antennae tickling the soles of my feet as I ran. On we ran. That spider matched me four steps for every one of mine. But I was a fast runner in those days, and while she did not fall behind much, she did not gain on me either. Around and around those caves we ran until I finally found a path that took me outside. On and on we ran, uphill and down dale, until finally I came to the river. It was frozen solid, so I kept on running right over to the other side. Wait a second, one of Boone's listeners interrupted. I thought you said you went prospecting in the summer. How could the river be frozen solid? 
Why, you see, Boone replied, without blinking an eye. Old Mrs. Spider and I had been running so long that by the time we came to the river it was the dead of winter on the coldest day of the year. Ah. Ah, indeed. Old man Boone digs a well. <clears throat> a couple of day laborers were sitting in the old barracks head tavern discussing a new well drilling rig that the Hammerites had developed when old man Boone pulled up a chair. I heard you young fellows discussing that new drilling machine and thought you might like to hear about how we had to dig wells back in my day. Back then all wells were dug wells, and mighty hard work it was too. The well was started with pick, shovel and spade, with the dirt thrown out the holes of the sides. You know how wells are commonly referred to as a certain number of handles deep, and not by any other common measure? That's because we used the handle of our spades to measure well depth, keeping a tally as we dug down. Anyhow, after a depth of three handles was reached, we'd set up a windlass at the top, an old half whiskey barrel at the bottom, and a stout rope connecting the two. The barrel was fixed with a heavy bale of wrought iron around the rim and a U-shaped handle that the rope was tied to. It was filled with dirt by the digger, then drawn up and emptied by two strong men like yourselves up at the top. It was hard work and dangerous, especially for the digger down at the bottom. Should the windlass break come loose, or should the rope frame come apart, the digger could be killed or crippled by the falling loaded barrel. Now on the day I'm thinking of, I was digging alone and was about 15 handles down when I hit a patch of hard pan. Hard pan, as you may not know, is a thin layer of gravelly rock and clay, no more than half a handle in depth, which usually overlays a thicker layer of gravel. The best way to get through it is with what's known as a munchin bar, a handle and half of your best tempered iron drawn to a point at one end. You lift it as high as you can and drop it down, over and over, to break up the rock and clay. Since I was working alone, I didn't have the normal windlass arrangement. Instead, I had placed a stout log over the well mount and looped the bucket rope over that. When I had a pool barrel of rock and dirt, I would wedge my munchin bar into the side of the well at the bottom, haul the barrel to the top, tie off the rope to the munchin bar, and then hand over hand to the top where I would empty the barrel. In any while, that day I struck a pan of hard pan about 20 handles down, maybe 30. I just hauled twice my weight in wet clay and gravel up to the top, tied off the rope and overhanded my way to within maybe five handles of the top, when the munchin bar let loose from the sides of that well and the rope came free. Say, digging this here well is mighty thirsty work. You wouldn't... Why, thank you, kind sir. Right up to the top, if you please, Betsy. Where was I? Oh, yes. There I was, dropping 30 handles or more, with that bucket rock above me and the hard band below. There was no space to dodge. All I could do was land with my legs bent, hunch my shoulders, and hope that all that rope climbing had made me strong enough. The half barrel hit me on my back harder than a hammerite pounding a pagan. Hit me so hard that it drove me clear through the hard pan, the gravel beneath, and opened a hole to an underground stream. The water then rushed up that well shaft, lifting me to the top, and threw me five handles up into a nearby oak tree. Later on, the city of Aldeo capped off the gushing water with a decorative fountain. You may have seen it. Mm. Mm -hmm, indeed. Your skepticism is probably warranted, Guy. What are the books does he have here? Introductory Mining Engineering. Mining Reference Handbooks, Volume 1 and 2. Underground Mining Methods, Engineering Fundamentals. Mining Engineering Analysis. Techniques in Underground... Wow. Why mining? This is a... Magister... Uh, that's Leopold. It's barely readable, but okay, what about, can I read these? Gramophone. Project Gramophone. Chief Engineer Leopold. Site Acoustic Supervisor Edward Leon Scott de Martinville. Page 2 of 12. Huh. Bon autograph. He likes to invent musical machinery. Uh, audio machinery. Mine tracks, their location and construction. With the exception of gravity roads on the heavier grades, where wood is still preferred on account of its higher coefficient of friction, standard INT rails now in general use for mine tracks, blah blah blah. blah. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not going to read the table of contents there. All the things I might read. Now, so there's nothing I need here. I should be informed of the motive behind. Hmm? There's something in the air these days. These eyes of mine are getting old. They can no longer be trusted completely. Oh shit! Well, that's a fail. Something more. Ahem. Who is it? Who this time? Yeah, sorry, it's, it's me fumbling with the door and you know, hurry because I quick saved just as you were coming through. Oh no. Ahem. I was 
using that light. Hello? Yeah, so the fact that you come in and turn the light and there's no way of hiding is, and then you insta fail is honestly uh, not what I would call great design. Uh -huh. Just don't care. Good. What room is that? Ah, uh, that's a FWC. Seems like she likes uh, adventure stories, detective stories, romance. Lots of lots of lots of reading there. I will not read out the titles. Scrap of golden ribbon. What's that for? Ah, that's where she's at. That's where she's out. Sewing thimble. Oh. Ah. Rub it all. A dining egg. What is all this stuff good for? I don't know. I don't even know what a dining egg is. Some waste plant potatoes, blah 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 blah, okay. Pills and their uses. Bearberry, double dark. Hmm, none of this seems, uh... Particularly, oh hello, Polygon and Atom by Florum. Henry Solomon Seal is used with other plants in creating an internal medicine with astringent properties. A little known secondary application is to reduce polygon counts in large urban areas with long lines of sight. Simply apply a tincture made from the Polygon Atom flower externally to the textures involved. This will decrease the likelihood of dromid crashes without resulting to goat sacrifice. That's a very useful tip. Um, might not be relevant to Garrett just now, but... Uh, Absolutely valuable. Huh. Christopher's vegetables, your key to healthy eating. Uh, broccoli cabbage. Comes in a range of sizes, red, green, blue, purple and white to name a few. Wait, the heart of the cabbage is the portion of the central core of the cabbage stem. The leg, which extends up through the center of the cabbage head. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Good thing you noted that down gap because if we come back to strawberries, no. Cabbage. Yeah, this explains the one leg, this explains the heart inside the head. Yes, I love cabbage. It's much more cabbagey, <coughs> excuse me, than strawberry ish. Who's the first vegetable? You're healthy eating. Blah, 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 blah. This guy's a nut. It preaches about broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, and watercress. Who needs to know that cabbage comes in colors? Or that the core at the center of a head of cabbage is called its heart? Rabbit food. I think I'll go to the kitchen and get a steak. Ah, okay. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely useful. Alright, wow, okay. Lots more titles. And a key to something. 
<sighs> An alphabetical list of plants. Only up going up to E. Hmm. Another skull? Oh, hello. Oh, it's hiding. Folded note. Dearest Osteria, in that book which is my memory, on the first page, that is the chapter when I first met you, appear the words, here begins a new life. Your faithful servant, Pavel. Should I return the skull? I mean, there's two skulls I've got. Do I need skulls? I don't think I ever need skulls, right? Or maybe I do. Maybe they're ingredients. Potions and stuff. Don't think I need potted plants. Wait, what? Oh, they share quarters. We share the the room in between. Empty bottle, empty potion bottle with stopper. Good. So I could make two of those potions, perhaps. Religion among the unheralded peoples. What religion means a binding together or a system of uh, blah 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 blah. Alec Fratel. The Anharis were closely in touch with their spirit world. In matters of physical health, they relied on spiritual remedies. Exorcisms were used to expel the demons that caused illness. Magical noisemakers were common exorcism tools. Here's a typical weekly menu for the god procedure at his chief temple. Lots of stuff. 32 barring eggs, 16 male slaves, 32 female slaves. Burial rites. Body was wrapped in a reed matting, coffin, blah 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 blah. Ah. Yeah. Ah. Superbly interesting. Alright. So far I've found there was nothing in bathrooms. Hello, old man Boone and the valley corn snake. I don't know if you recall Pipe Creek the way it was before them hammers paved it over and turned it into an underground sewer. But back when I was a young man, it was one of the best fishing creeks this side of Dayport. Old man Boone paused to take a sip from his glass. Well, one day I decided to take the day off from barrack wrangling and see if I could catch me some fish. And since I might work up a fair thirst, what with all that baiting and casting and sitting and all, I got out a fresh jug of John Valigon's special squeeze in to bring along. Anyhow, I trotted out the Pipe Creek, and pretty soon I found myself a nice shady spot to sit and cast my line from. I baited up and tossed out my line. Now, after the long walk out to the creek, my throat seemed a mite dry and scratchy, so I uncorked Mr. Ballycorn and took a small ship. The day was warm and lazy, and in a little while I fell to napping. I don't know what woke me up, but on waking I found that my pole had been dragged from my hands down to the water's edge, and there was a big old serpent who had wrapped around a tree at one end and around my pole at the other, looking like all get out that it was trying to land a fish. Say, young fellow, you wouldn't happen to have a couple of coppers for Betsy here to refill my glass? It's mighty dry talking like this. Ah, oh, thank you kindly, darling. Your health, sir. Well, I just sat back and watched that snake's full work for a while, sipping at my jug. Pretty soon that old snake had managed to land one of the fattest catfish I'd ever seen. After a moment to catch its breath, the serpent looked me in the eye, looked at the fish, looked at my jug, then looked back at me with its mouth partway open. <coughs> <'Cause> <coughs> well, I'm no one to refuse a polite request for a drink. <coughs> I poured a small libation into its open mouth. That snake's eyes went wide, then began to water. The next thing I knew, Mr. Snake had slithered into the creek and disappeared. I figured I had seen the last of that snake, so I took a sip myself and dangled my feet over the bank. 
I started baiting up my hook when I felt a tug on my shirt tail. There was that old snake with nice fat bass in its coils and his mouth wide open. What could I do? I had to pour the snake another libation, didn't I? After a small cough, off it went, back into the water, this time coming back with a great big perch grasped in its mouth. Well, that snake and I kept up this game till my jug was near dry. By now that snake was not swimming so well, and navigated the bank with increasing difficulty. This last time, all it had in its mouth was a minnow, but it seemed to weigh down that snake's head something considerable. It proceeded in this wandering way for some time, looking for the landing and getting more and more off course when two new snakes came swimming out of the rushes. They slipped along on either side of my boon companion, one wrapping a tail around the neck and the other around the middle. Pretty soon all three snakes had disappeared into the weeds along the side of the stream. As my jug was empty and my fishing creel was full, I headed home. Say, whose turn is it to refill my glass? Wait, objective? Bonus, read all eight boon tails. Nice. Perfect. Knew there was a reason to go into the bathroom. I wasn't to open doors into my face. Yeah, there's nothing in there but the tissue, right? Yeah. Oh, you're guarding there. You won't mind if I pop in here, will you? Just on the off chance there's something. Bullshit. Could have done that, I could have turned the lights off. Here's me being an idiot and not realizing. Okay, so Magister Pavel and Headmaster Coleman's room is left to go to. And then we can go up to the attic. Might have been over here. I know you're here somewhere. They saw something. Okay, he's given up searching. I guess I did just put my head into the light there. Careless of me. Surely you realize I will find you eventually. You will, will you? Not if you give up that quickly. There's a nice dark patch in the doorway here, so... Also a sleeper. Theory of the room key. Right, so there's another key I got, but I don't know what it was. Um, I don't have a list of keys here. Do I? Yeah, I found in, in Australia's room, but I guess it must have been for this doll, but a pair of dice. I didn't see the uh, notification for some reason, so I didn't know what key it was. Yeah, probably that's not play the cover phone, shall we? I think we'd be likely to wake up this fellow. Okay, he's reading the play. 
love poem, dearest Osteria, and in life's noisiest hour there whisper still the ceaseless love of thee, the heart self solace and soliloquy. You mould my hopes, you fashion me within, and to the leading love throb in the heart, through all my being, through my pulses beat, you lie in all my many thoughts, like light, like the fair light of dawn or summer eve, on rippling stream or cloud reflecting lake, and looking to the heaven that bends above you, how oft I bless the lot that made me love you. Your faithful servant, Pavel. Love poem. Dearest Osteria, come to me in my dreams, and then by day I shall be well again. For then the night will more than pay the hopeless longing of the day. Come, as I came a thousand times, a messenger from radiant climes, and smile on thy new world, and be as kind to others as to me. Or, as thou never canst in sooth, come now, and let me dream it truth and part my hair, and kiss my brow, and say, My love, why sufferest thou? Your faithful servant, Pavel. Hmm. Hmm. Ah, she hmm. likes plays, theatres, directing in the theatre, directing for the theatre. Hmm. Select a collection of Precosa plays. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Magister Pamel, sir. I've lost my Electrum play to Spanner. I must have set it down somewhere in the auditorium when I last worked there, as I haven't seen it out of it. If you or any of your students find it, please drop it off in my office. Thank you. Riando, head judge, sir. Hmm. Lots of pagans, right? Electron plated spanner in auditorium. Do I need that? I'm gonna go back there and search the auditorium quite happily. Anything over here? Seemeth not. Sleep well. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's got another poem at his feet there. Dearest Osteria, my love in her attire doth show her wit. It doth so well become her. For every season she hath dressings fit for winter, spring, and summer. No beauty she doth miss when all her robes are on. But beauty's self she is when all her robes are gone. Your faithful servant, Pavel. Mm -hmm. Wait, are you the... Uh... The headmaster man. So I have to be careful in here because you'll probably come in and turn the lights on like everybody else. Even if I turn them off. Holy water, there we go, we needed that. Mm hmm, mm hmm, books. Goldfish in a bowl. Let's swim around. That's very cleverly done. Uh, books I'm not going to read. Okay, let's come in here and get these candles off. Chart compass, okay. Sextant, don't think I need those. Another coil of rope for a rope arrow. Oh, I just use that and get a rope arrow. Okay. Master and Commander. Tying knots and all sorts of guys. One. 
Only in silence the word, only in dark delight, only in dying life, bright the hawk's flight on an empty sky. Two. My hand is copper, my brow is lead. Suffer me in a red patina, swept along in a molten flow to a sad eternity. My stride interrupted, my thoughts untimed, my tears become drops of silver and shattered the crystalline fern. I plead the wind to sweep us away, my alabastrian limbs, useless and tired, my carnelian heart, beatless and mired. 3. I pick the gilded apple from the iron tree, I wipe the rust from my brow. The paths of thief and god are worn as one in the earth. The earth rejects me, foul and changed, the wind refuses me, unsightly and maimed. My voice is corrupted, my tongue unwinds, my pulse is mercurial sickened, it slows. Destiny and danger are still focused on the one, the renegade, who is both brethren and betrayer. Beware the spider, for he weaves both labyrinth and lair. My heart it ceases, my breath undrawn, my eyes forever focused on the sanguine metal door. My hand is copper, dead. Hmm. Yeah, that rings a bell, doesn't it? The uh, prophecy from Thief 2, uh, sorry. As long as you move before the other guy comes, leave the door open for a quick retreat. I hope the other guy's coming now. I guess he doesn't come all the way into his office. It's too late to be in the office, right? He did turn the light on there, as I feared. Marlon caught off Markham's Isles by Captain Coleman. It is doubtful I will ever know what it was I saw. Okay. So now we need to head to the attic, I suppose. I'm a little surprised about that. That window, the locked window, has not had any. I'm not being able to do anything with it. Not found any. Any more locking keys, locking rings, or whatever you call them. Where's this go? Oh, that is. Right, I see it's up. That's the way the attic, yes. Well, there's rats in here. And furniture. Alright. Uh, what does this say? Generators. Okay. Storage and mechanicals. Going north. And I could turn the lights on. Old furniture. Lots of light fittings, so. though. Ah. 
Something about webs, huh? I see spiders in there. I can't. All right, the door closes itself. That's a problem. more than one. Perfect. Put the generator across. It's it's angry that is. No more than seven. I'm gonna need to keep seven rod heads, right? Well, good thing I've got seven left. <laughs> Walk through the webs and get webbed up. It's a nice touch. Alright, but there's nothing I need in here. Ah, oh, more spiders. It's a bigger one too. Well... Care if I need them elsewhere, I will use them now. Hello, webbed rats. Hello, I scurried swiftly without wings. Yet, caught in silvery silken strings, I dangled dead. Eight legs be fed, unless the spell with me is set. Wow. Hello. Another brass padlock. Two books. Okay, I'm going to come back to that and see if there's anything else in this attic that's of use to me. Why sometimes sometimes I can fit through diagonals and sometimes I can't. I guess the wide ones, but I can. Potion bottle and an old keeper map. That looks familiar. It's where they put the talismans, I guess. this one. There.
Wait a second. What is in that central area? Can I get through? Apparently not. But here. Yeah. No, okay, I guess I'm gonna have to go a long way around. Which way is the long way around? North. is a maze. It's amazing. Hang on. This isn't the maze of Van Hara, is it? <laughs> I mean, it's not entirely dissimilar, right? Oh, okay, we didn't copy the special holes, but... Hmm, it might be... I should check. I should go back to the start and see. So I did check in here, right? There was nothing else. Did I check in here? No. Can I fit through here? But no, see if this was the if this was the maze of Anhara, then uh entrances to the central room are right there in the middle, but that's where the generators are. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven spaces and one two three four five six seven eight nine no way more it's, it's definitely not the same base it would have been quite funny if it was though so. oh hello i see you there question is can i get there Oh, that is the other. That is the other place, right? That's the light that I turned on. Right, there's a whole quarter there that I can't reach. Hmm. Unless I can destroy the furniture, which seems unlikely. Right, well, let's go back and find that big spider and check out the books. Seems to be the next best thing to finding a way out of the uh, through the corner, the, the, the secret corners of the attic. What have we got? Common rooms of the world. Titula, chipmunk, mouse. Pack rat. Pack rat is a medium sized brown rat known for hoarding food and other objects. It is strongly attracted to shiny objects and will collect all it finds in its midden. A peculiar characteristic is that if they find something they want, they will drop what they are currently carrying. For example, a piece of food and trade it for the new item. I personally have observed one rat who kept picking up and dropping and picking up and dropping, clearly unable to decide between two stones which to carry back to its nest. They are particularly fond of shiny objects, leading to tales of rats swapping jewellery for a shiny pebble or ribbon. I think I have a piece of shiny ribbon. In houses, pack rats are most active nocturnally, searching for food and nesting material. Oh, 
Oh wow, I've got to write that down. Oh, this is actually, you could accompany down the whole thing, I hadn't even noticed. Treatise on nature, how boring. <laughs> right, makes a tasty meal in a pinch. Question, what are the feathers of knowledge? Response, when Master Keeper Asher, builder of the endless stairs, was but an acolyte, Master Scribe Yellow set him the task to pluck a tail feather from the bird of knowledge. Asher then set out on a journey that lasted a year and a day, searching for that fabulous bird. At the end of that time, he returned to Yellow empty-handed. Yellow only shrugged and pointed to a pile of ancient and deteriorating texts for Asher to copy onto New Bell. Asher read and wrote those texts for a year and a day. At the end of that time, he smiled, stood up, and handed his own quill to Master Yellow. Instruction The auguries of knowledge rise as smoke from a burnt offering, open them, opening the way forward. No extra notes, but that suggests Garrett's quill will be significant. Um, am I quite sure I can't make it through from here? I should try again. Because we need to access the attic, right? Yep, I can't make it through there. Let's make it through here by leaning. So how do we get through that doorway there? And also... Oh! Oh! These cliffs keep changing. Wait, 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 there was a five-digit code. Oh dear. This is this is gotta be the five digit code, right? What's the number? Eight five seven six four. So we need the T or the, the the capital I, capital T thing, the crusty one. And we need the Pioneer spacecraft. <laughs> oh that's the the dots on the left. The bow and arrow. T, bow and arrow. Then the hash. Then the boat with the mast. I mean, just a sailor, I suppose. Yeah, that's archer, that's a bow and arrow. That is a boat, a sailor. A banker with hash, just for, because they count money. Necromancer is like a cross for a cemetery, okay. And then the undead, which is like a hammer and sickle. So, cross. Bow and arrow, ash, boat, I'm dead. So 
bow and arrow, ash, we need boat, and then undead. That's undead. Where's the boat? There. That looks like a teleporter portal. I think I'm going to end the episode here and see you next time what's on the other side. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you here for the next episode.